Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and this morning I woke up to some rather contrasting news from Blue Origin versus SpaceX. Blue Origin were finally getting their first commercial flight underway. Uh, this had been originally uh, scheduled for December 19th. If you remember, Launchapalooza became Scrubapalooza. This is the last launch that has actually flown from that day. It was carrying eight NASA payloads, and they were paying customers for getting about uh, three to four minutes of microgravity. Eight experiments were boosted up on a flight that lasted, well, the booster flew for about seven and a half minutes, and the capsule took about 10 minutes to go up and down. During the flight, they reached a peak altitude of uh, 350,000 feet, or about uh, 106 kilometers. Peak speed on ascent was 2,200 miles per hour, or about Mach 3, and on the way down, the booster hit 2,600 miles per hour, or 4,180 kilometers per hour. Anyway, point is, this is a great thing for Blue Origin. You know, they finally got a service that they can sell. I'm not sure what kind of market there is for this short duration, um, you know, microgravity, but hey, you know, they were stressing how clean their micro G's are. I mean, I'm going to say SpaceX is going to give you nice and clean micro G's, but they are going to have to spend a lot longer in space. Uh, yeah, it's a great little stream. Uh, the sound, I'm going to say, was fantastic, especially on the landing. It's very clear that they had a microphone placed really close to the landing site, so you can hear that uh, booster coming down. You hear the sonic booms from multiple locations, and yeah, it was it was really impressive to hear that. They also released a new animation for New Glenn. Now, New Glenn is their larger rocket. In fact, it's probably the largest rocket that we're, seri we're, we're likely to see flying anytime soon. We're still not sure, you know, BFR keeps changing, but, you know, New Shepard is very likely to go ahead, and it is absolutely a monster. Uh, it's going to have seven first stage engines, the BE-4 methane uh, liquid oxygen engines. It's going to have a seven meter wide fairing. So you're not as big as BFR, but it has got a whole lot of funding behind it. In particular, not only did they get $500 million from the, the US Air Force, they also have Jeff Bezos behind them, who of course is the world's richest man. Although half of his fortune will be walking out the door when he gets a divorce. That's the way it works. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they've changed that up a little. They, they released a new animation for New Glenn. And the main thing that changed is the upper stage is now no longer using the BE-4 engine. They are going to use a BE-3 engine, which is the same engine that is flying on New Shepard. The difference is the engine that's on New Shepard, I believe the turbo pumps run using something called a tap-off cycle, where they basically take pressure from the combustion chamber to run the turbines. Whereas the BE-3U, RV, I don't know, whatever. It's a vacuum variant, and it is going to use a um, an expander cycle engine. And that, that is very similar to the RL10 that I mentioned in a previous video. So they released a new animation. Also, in the last few months, they also they took delivery of their ship that they're converting to be their landing pad and all that. But anyway, yes, enough Blue Origin. Let's go and uh, take a look at what's been happening in Boca Chica, Texas. Oh dear, yeah. Woke up and apparently the nose cone of the Starship Hopper was blown over last night in 50 mile per hour winds. I say last night, it's obviously two nights ago now since uh, this is a day later. But yeah, that's uh, unfortunate. I'm going to say, you know, Obviously, when I've been posting about this, there's been a lot of people with a lot of opinions uh, suggesting how successful this might be. Many people are not convinced, and understandably so. I don't. I like to hear your opinions, but I'm going to say all the haters. None of you predicted this thing would fall over in the winds. I mean, you predicted it might explode or uh, some other problem, or it was just fake. But yeah. The only person I've ever heard of, uh, you know, rockets blowing over in the wind would be uh, Andy Weir, you know, in The Martian. So yeah, Andy Weir, you called it, nobody else did. But seriously, this fairing, this is really a fairing. It's totally empty and it's fell over and it's like kind of squished on the side. 
I don't know if they're going to rebuild it. Clearly, they built it very, very quickly. So they might just build a new one or they might stick it back up and bend it back into shape and see how it works. Most of the really important hardware is still in the bottom section. The bottom section has the tanks. It had the engines. The engines have been taken out now and put to one side. Uh, there's various other things going into it, but that clearly is the important bit. And this uh, section on the front is largely for show by the looks of things. Anyway, the bigger and more interesting news is that Elon gave an interview to Popular Mechanics explaining the use of steel in the BFR and Super Heavy. Uh, if you remember, he talked about how the, pro the idea was delightfully counterintuitive and he, he went on to explain that. But obviously, the upper stage, everything that we figured out is pretty much correct, right? We're going to have one half of it is going to be the upstream half or the upwind half is just going to be you know, solid metal. It's not going to be cooled or anything. The windward side is going to have active cooling. They're going to blow uh, or introduce liquid methane fuel. And as it boils, it's going to escape through tiny pores in the surface. And that, of course, will provide an insulating layer. If you've watched my video on heat shields, you'll know that the, the ablative cooling or ablative heat shields work by the, via this mechanism. The heat causes gases to evolve and those gases then pr produce a protective layer. Now, you might think that actually blowing your know, methane out into an oxygen nitrogen atmosphere might lead to more burning but you know if you do take a quick look at it it actually doesn't account for that much but it does enough to reduce the temperature down to where they can handle the re-entry and presumably it will work for any levels of re-entry if you have enough uh, fuel to feed it. But Elon basically explained that the delightfully counterintuitive part of this is that making it out of stainless steel actually works out to be lighter than making it out of carbon fiber. And that's kind of mind blowing because obviously steel is this cheap, heavy material. Carbon fiber is this expensive, high tech stuff that, you know, is in theory, stronger and all sorts better in all sorts of ways. But one factor that everyone's been missing, and I guess Elon and his buddies picked up on, is that the tanks, the walls of the booster, are essentially fuel tanks for cryogenic fluids. So certain types of steel, if you chill them down to cryogenic temperatures. We've seen the demo where you chill certain types of metal down and then you hit it with a hammer and it fractures, right? That is things like ferritic and martensic um, steel, and I probably misspelled that or mispronounced that, Mr. Uh, metallurgists out there. But ostentic steels, which have a face-centered cubic crystal structure, those actually get stronger when they get cooled down to cryogenic temperatures. Depending upon the temperature, it could be 50 to 100% stronger, which is kind of crazy. And this means that when you're filling the rocket up with the cryogenic fluid, it gets stronger. And that's exactly when it needs to be strong because that's when it's filled up and carrying the most loads and the most weight. So this meant, I guess, that you can make the walls thinner, get the same strength, and have it handle higher temperatures. And for a bonus, they, he talked about how the cost of carbon fiber is about $200 per kilogram when you account for the wastage, whereas stainless steel, good old 304 series, is about $3 per kilogram. So it's insanely cheaper as well. And I mean, I'm going to have to go out and do some research on this because I'm not a structural engineer. I'm not a metallurgist, but I'm kind of, I'm, I'm sort of convinced by this argument. I mean, obviously, he went and convinced a bunch of other people about it. Uh, I mean, it does kind of bring me back to the days of Bob Truax and the Sea Dragon. You know, Robert Truax was a rocket designer and he was a guy that came up with the Sea Dragon. And you'll see lots of videos about Sea Dragon on YouTube and it'll be like, oh, ha, ha, these people building this you know, big, dumb rocket. And, you know, Robert Truax was actually, uh, he was quite smart about this. His argument always was that, well, well, was that he'd looked at the design of rockets and how they had basically, you know, tried to refine the design and make them as light and small as possible. And he noticed that 
pretty much the, no matter how small they made the rocket, the cost per kilogram to launch was the same. And so he kind of decided, let's go the other way and build a big, dumb rocket. And his argument was the cost per kilogram to launch would be identical, regardless of whether you were doing it with super space age materials or the same stuff they made ships out of. And that's what this feels like to me. So obviously, uh, <laughs> I'm waiting to see what happens down in Boca Chica, how they're going to, you know, knock the the dents out of this nose cone or build a new one. Um, but yes, yeah, Super Heavy does, see, we've seen a few more of the mysteries solved about it. And I suspect that the people working on carbon fiber were probably parts of the layoffs in, uh, uh, in uh, you know, SpaceX. Elsewhere, there's another couple of uh, interesting news developments that I'm just gonna touch on. Strato launch, if you remember, biggest wingspan of any aircraft, exceeded the wingspan of the Spruce Goose, which is appropriate because I'm thinking this is going to go the way of the Spruce Goose. They just announced that they are cancelling any rocket development, which means the only thing that this air launch platform can carry are the Pegasus XL launchers. And Pegasus XL was great when it came out 20 years ago. These days, it's not cost competitive by any means. And in the last five or ten years I think there's only it's only launched like four times so strato launch coming along and saying look we will launch three at once that is not a viable business model by any means so I think at this point they with Paul Allen dying the drive to do anything with strato launch has kind of evaporated I think they're gonna you know validate that it can fly show that it can carry payloads and then hope that somebody else wants to come along and say that they could stick their rocket on it because as it is right now there is no way they're going to get any business with this and finally up in alaska vector space systems are starting to move hardware in to do a rocket test up at the kodiak spaceport and this is really cool. This is an even smaller rocket than Electron. It runs on uh, propylene as its fuel, which is pretty cool. But unfortunately, its launch paperwork is going to be kind of hung up and held up by the government shutdown. So we don't know when that's going to happen, but it will be something to look out for in the coming months. And it'll be another entry into the small launch vehicle market, which is uh, getting rather crowded. But yeah. Hoping that we'll continue to see developments on every front. Uh, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.